All right, today we are starting off in... Hey, Caitlin. <laughs> um, so today we are starting off with Chapter 3 of Tower of Dawn, um, which is section number 12, I believe. I numbered mine a little bit wrong, so I have to add one um, every time. But if I go ahead and put this up, here is the tandem read guide for everybody's reference. Again, we are starting off with chapter three of Tower of Dawn. So we will be doing one tower, one chapter in this book, switching to the next book for a couple chapters and then switching back. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're doing today. I'm going to take the guide off now. My brain really is not here today. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Also, um, Caitlin, this, since you're just now joining, uh, LaMamda is here in person today! They are off camera, slightly. You can see the, the very tippy of their leg right there. The, the very tippy top, right there. And their phone. There you go. And they have my cat. Hi! <laughs> um, sorry, Bella, I don't usually follow people back on Twitter unless I know them, so that is a no. Uh, also, not appropriate to ask in a Twitch chat. Just saying. If you do add, this is your warning, if you ask again, I, I will be timing you out. Okay. <clears throat> On to chapter three of Tower of Dawn by Sarah J. Moss. Nesrin had gone into shock, and Kaol could not go to her. Could not scoop her into his arms and hold her close. Not when she had walked, silent and drifting like a wraith, right into a bedroom of the lavish suite they'd been appointed on the first floor of the palace, and shut the door behind her. As if she had forgotten anyone else in the world existed. He didn't blame her. Kao let the servant, a fine-boned young woman with chestnut hair that fell in heavy curves, heavy curls to her narrow waist wheel him into the second bedroom. The suite overlooked a garden of fruit trees and burbling fountains, cascades of pink and purple blossoms hanging from potted plants anchored into the balcony wall above. They provided living curtains before his towering bedroom windows. Doors, he realized. The servant mumbled something about drawing a bath, her use of his language unwieldy compared to the skill of the Kagan and his children. Not that he was in any position to judge. He was barely fluent in any of the other languages within his own continent. He slipped behind a carved wooden screen that no doubt led into his bathing chamber, and Kaol peered through his still-open bedroom door, across the pale marble foyer, to the shut doors of Nesrin's bedroom. They should not have left. He couldn't have done anything, but... He knew what the no not knowing would do to Nesrin. What it was already doing to him. Dorian was not dead, he told himself. He had gotten out. Fled. If he were in Parrington's grip, Erewhon's grip, they would have known. Prince Argon would have known. His city, sacked by the witches. He wondered if Manon Blackbeak had led the attack. Kale tried and failed to recount where the debts were stacked between them. Aelin had spared Manon's life at Temis's temple. But Manon had given them vital information about Dorian under the Volg th thrall. Did it make them even? Or tentative allies? It was a waste to hope that Manon would turn against Morath. But he set up a silent prayer to whatever god might be listening to protect Dorian, to guide his king to friendlier harbors. Dorian would make it. He was too clever, too gifted not to. There was no other alternative, none, that Kaol would accept. Dorian was alive and safe, or on his way to safety. And when Kale got a moment, he was going to squeeze the information out of the eldest prince, mourning or no. Everything Argon knew, he would know. And then he'd ask that servant girl to come every merchant ship for information about the attack. No word. There had been no word about Aelin, where she was now, what she'd been doing. Aelin, who might very well be the thing that cost him this alliance. He ground his teeth, 
and was still grinding them as the sweet doors opened and a tall, broad-shouldered man strode in as if he owned the place. Kaol supposed he did. Prince Caution was alone and unarmed. Though he moved with the ease of a person confident in his body's unfailing strength. How, Kaol supposed, he himself had once walked about the palace in Rifthold. Kaol lowered his head in greeting as the prince shut the hall door and surveyed him. It was a warrior's assessment, frank and thorough. When his brown eyes at last met Kaol's, the prince said in Adderlin's tongue, Injuries like yours are not uncommon here. I have seen many of them, especially among the horse tribes, my family's people. Kaol didn't particularly feel like discussing his injuries with the prince, with anyone, so he only nodded. I'm sure you have. Caution cocked his head, scanning Kaol again, his dark braids slipping over his muscled shoulders. Reading, perhaps, Kaol's desire not to start down this particular road. My father indeed wishes you both to join us at dinner, and more than that, to join us every night afterward while you are here, and sit at the high table. It wasn't a strange request of a visiting dignitary, and it was certainly an honor to sit at the Kagan's own table. But it, to send his son to do it? Kaol considered his next words carefully, then simply chose the most obvious one. Why? Surely the family wished to keep close to one another after losing their youngest member. Inviting strangers to join them? The prince's jaw tightened. Not a man used to veiling his emotions, as his three elder siblings were. Argon reports our palace is safe of spies from Duke Parrington's forces. That his agents have not yet come. I am not of that belief. And Sartak. The prince caught himself, as if not wanting to bring in his brother. Or potential ally. Caution grimaced. There was a reason I chose to live amongst soldiers. The double talk of this court. Kale was tempted to say he understood, had felt that way for most of his life, but he asked, You think Parrington's forces have infiltrated this court? How much did Caution, or Argon, know of Parrington's forces? Know the truth of the Vol king who wore Parrington's skin, or the armies he commanded, worse than any their imaginations might conjure. But that information, he'd keep that to himself, see if it could somehow be used if Argon and the Kagan did not know of it. Caution rubbed at his neck. I do not know if it is Parrington, or someone from Terrasen, or Melisande, or Wendelin. All I know is that my sister is now dead. Kale's heart stumbled a beat, but he dared ask. How did it come about? Grief flickered in Caution's eyes. Tomaloon was always a bit wild, reckless, prone to moods. One day, happy and laughing, the next withdrawn and hopeless. They, his throat bobbed, they say she leapt from her balcony because of it. Duva, Duva and her former husband found, Duva and her husband found her later that night. Any death in the family was devastating, but a suicide? I'm sorry, Kale offered quietly. Kashin shook his head, sunlight from the garden dancing on his black hair. I do not believe it. My Tumaloon would not have jumped. My Tumaloon. The words told enough about the prince's closeness to his younger sister. You suspect foul play? All I know is that no matter Tumaloon's moods, I knew her. As I know my own heart. He put a hand over it. She would not have jumped. Kael considered his words carefully once again. As sorry as I am for your loss, do you have any reason to suspect why a foreign kingdom might have engineered it? Caution paced a few steps. No one within our lands would be stupid enough. Well, no one within Terrison or Adderland would ever do such a thing, even to manipulate it, you into war. Caution studied him for a heartbeat. Even a queen who was once an assassin herself? Kale didn't let one flicker of emotion show. Assassin she might have been, but Aelin had hard lines that she did not cross. Killing or harming children was one of them. Caution paused before the dresser against the garden wall, adjusting a gilded box on its polished dark surface. I know. I read that in my brother's reports, too. 
details of her kills. Kale could have sworn the prince shuddered before he added, I believe you. No doubt why the prince was even having this conversation with him. Caution went on. Which leaves not many other foreign powers who might do it. And Parrington at the top of that short list. But why target your sister? I do not know. Caution paced another few steps. She was young, guileless. She rode with me amongst the Dargan, our mother clans. She had no sulde of her own yet. At Kael's narrowed brows, the prince clarified. It is a spear all Dargan warriors carry. We bind strands of our favored horse's hair to the shaft beneath the blade. Our ancestors believed that where those hairs waved in the wind, there our destinies waited. Some of us still believe in such things. But even those who think it mere tradition, we bring them everywhere. There is a courtyard in this palace where my sulde and those of my siblings are planted to feel the wind while we remain at our father's palace. Sorry, one second. Right beside his own, but in death. Again, that shadow of grief. Grief. In death. There are only, they are the only object that we keep. They bear the soul of a Dargan warrior for eternity and are left planted atop a step in our sacred realm. The prince closed his eyes. Now her soul will roam with the wind. Nasrin had said as much earlier. Kale only repeated, I'm sorry. Caution opened his eyes. Some of my siblings do not believe me about Tumalun. Some do. Our father... He remains undecided. Our mother will not even leave her room thanks to her grief. And mentioning my suspicions might... I cannot bring myself to mention them to her. He rubbed his strong jaw. So I have convinced my father to have you join us at dinner every night as a gesture of diplomacy. But I should like you to watch. With an outsider's eyes. To report anything amiss. Perhaps you will see something we don't. Help them and perhaps receive help in return. Kael said baldly, If you trust me enough to have me do that, to tell me all this, then why not agree to join with us in the, this war? It is not my place to say or guess, a trained soldier. Caution examined the suite as if assessing any potential enemies lying in wait. I march only when my father gives the order. If Parrington's forces were already here, if Morath was indeed behind the princess's murder, it'd be too easy. Too easy to sway the Kagan into siding with Dorian and Aelin. Parrington, Erewhon, was far smarter than that. But if Kael himself were to win over the commander of the Kagan's terrestrial armies to their cause, I do not play those games, Lord Westfall, said Caution, reading whatever sparked in Kael's eyes. My other siblings are not the ones you will wish to convince. My other siblings are the ones you will wish to convince. Kale tapped a finger on the arm of his chair. Any advice on that front? Kashin snorted, smiling faintly. Others have come before you, from kingdoms far richer than your own. Some succeeded, some didn't. A glance at Kale's legs, a flicker of pity entering the prince's eyes. Kale clenched the arms of the chair at that pity from a man who recognized a fellow warrior. Wishes for good luck are all I can offer you. Then the prince was striding for the doors, his long legs eating up the distance. If Parrington has an agent here, Kaol said, as caution reached the sweet doors, then you've already seen that everyone in this palace is in grave danger. You must take action. Caution paused with his hand on the carved doorknob, glancing over his shoulder. Why do you think I've asked a foreign lord for assistance? Then the prince was gone, his words hanging in the sweet-scented air. The tone wasn't cruel, wasn't insulting, but the warrior's frankness of it. Kale struggled to master his breathing, even as the thoughts swirled. He'd seen no black rings or collars, but then he hadn't been looking for them had not even considered that the shadow of Morath might have already stretched this far. 
Kale rubbed at his chest. Careful. He'd have to be careful in this court. With what he said publicly. With what he said in this room, too. Kale was still staring at the shut door, mulling over all caution had implied, when the servant emerged, her tunic and pants replaced by a tied robe of thinnest, sheerest silk. It left nothing to the imagination. He clamped down on the urge to shout for Nesrin to assist him instead. Only wash me, he said, as clearly and firmly as he could. She showed no nerves, no tremor of hesitation, and he knew she had done this before, countless times, as she only asked, Am I not to your liking? It was a stark, honest question. She was paid well for her services. All the servants were. She chose to be here, and another could easily be found at no risk to her status. You are, Kaol said, only half lying, refusing to let his gaze drop below her eyes. Very pleasing, he clarified. But I only want a bath, he added, just to be sure. Nothing else from you. He'd expected her gratitude, but the servant only nodded, unruffled. Even with her, he'd have to be careful with what he said what he and Nesrin might discuss in these rooms. There hadn't been a sound or a flicker of movement behind Nesrin's closed bedroom doors, and there certainly wasn't now. So he motioned to let the servant push his chair into the bathing chamber, veils of steam rippling through the white and blue tiled room. The chair glided over carpet and tile, curving around the furniture with little effort. Nesrin herself had found the chair in the now vacant healer's catacombs of Riftold's castle right before they'd sailed here. One of the few items the fleeing healers had left behind, it seemed. Lighter and sleeker than what he'd expected, the large wheels flanking the, the seat rotated easily, even when he used the slender metal hand rim to guide them himself. Unlike the stiff bulk of others he'd seen, this chair came equipped with two small front wheels, just on either side of the wooden footrests, each capable of swiveling in any direction he chose. And now, they smoothly turned into the waiting steam of the bathing chamber. A large sunken pool filled most of it, oils gleaming on the surface, interrupted only by scattered, drifting petals. A small window high in the far wall peeked into the greenery of the garden, and candles gilded the billowing steam. Luxury. Utter luxury while his city suffered, while they pleaded for help that had not come. Dorian would have wanted to stay. Only absolute defeat, no chance of survival, would have prompted him to leave. Kale wondered if his magic had played any part, helped any of them. Dorian would find his way to safety, to allies. He knew it in his bones, though his stomach continued to roil. There was nothing he could do to help his king from here, save for forging this alliance. Even if every instinct screamed at him to return to Adderlin, to find Dorian... He'd stay the course. Kale barely noticed the servant removing his boots in efficient tugs. And though he could have done it himself, he barely remarked on her removing his teal jacket, then the shirt beneath. But he dragged himself from his thoughts at last when she began to remove his pants. When he leaned in to help, gritting his teeth as they worked together in stilted silence. It was only when she reached to remove his undershorts that he gripped her wrist. He and Nesrin still hadn't touched each other beyond an ill-fated bout on the ship three days ago. He hadn't conveyed any sort of desire to take that step once again. He'd wanted to, though. Woke up most mornings aching to, especially when they'd shared that bed in their stateroom. But the thought of being so prone, of not being able to take her the way he'd once done, it had curdled any brimming lust, even while grateful that certain parts of him still undoubtedly worked. I can get it on my own, Kaol said. And before the servant could move, he gathered the strength in his arms, his back, and began easing himself from the chair. It was an unceremonious process, one he'd figured out during the long days at sea. First, he flicked the locking mechanisms on the wheels, the click echoing off the stone and water. Within a few motions, he maneuvered himself to the edge of the chair, then removed his feet from the wooden plates and onto the floor angling his legs to his left as he did so. With his right hand, he gripped the edge of the seat by his knees, 
while he curled the left into a fist as he bent over to brace it on the cool, steam-slick tiles. Slippery. The servant only padded over, laid a thick white cloth before him, and backed away. He gave her a grateful, closed-lipped smile as he braced his left fist against on the floor. Atop the plush cloth, distributing his weight throughout the arm. With an inhaled breath, his right hand still gripping the edge of his chair, he carefully lowered himself to the ground, swinging his rear away from the chair as his knees bent unbidden. He landed with a thud, but he was on the floor, at least. Hadn't toppled over, as he had the first half-dozen times he tried to do it on the ship. Carefully, he scooted to the edge of the pool stairs, until he could set his feet into the warm water, right atop the second step. The servant strode into the water a heartbeat later, graceful as an egret, her gossamer robe turning an ups as insubstantial as dew while water crept up its length. Her hands were gentle but steady while she gripped him under the arm and helped him hoist himself the last bit into the pool, setting himself down on the top step. When she guided him down another and another until he was sitting up to his shoulders, eye level with her full, peaked breasts. She didn't seem to notice, and he immediately averted his gaze toward the window as she reached for the small tray of supplies she'd left near the lip of the pool. Oils and brushes and soft-looking cloths. Kale slid his undershorts off while she turned, setting them with a loud, wet smack upon the edge of the pool. Nasrin still didn't emerge from her room, so Kale closed his eyes, submitting himself to the servant's ministrations, and wondered what the hell he was going to do. And that was chapter three of Tower of Dawn. Now, why in the world has my Discord been blowing up this entire time? <clears throat> also, I can catch up with chat. Um. Aw, thank you, Tucarm. Thank you. You're so sweet. I'm doing all right. My brain is not really here today. Also, my allergies are killing me. So that's why I keep itching my nose. Because it's itchy. And I apologize. <clears throat> Okay, we are switching over to the Empire of Storms book now for Chapter 9. <laughs> okay. Back over to Empire of Storms, Chapter 9. Elid Lockin knew she was being hunted. For three days now, she'd tried to lose whatever tracked her through the endless sprawl of Oakwald. And in the process, she herself had become lost. Three days hardly sleeping, barely stopping long enough to scavenge for food and water. She turned south once, to backtrack and shake it off her trail. She'd wound up heading a day in that direction, then west toward the mountains, then south, possibly east. She couldn't tell. She'd been running then, Oakwald so dense that she could hardly track the sun, and without a clear view of the stars, not daring to stop and find an easy tree to climb, she couldn't find the Lord of the North, her beacon home. By noon on the third day, she was close to weeping, from exhaustion, from rage, from bone-deep fear. Whatever took its time hunting her would surely take its time killing her. Her knife trembled in her hand as she paused in a clearing a swift, nimble stream dancing through it. Her leg ached, her ruined, useless leg. She'd offer the dark god her soul for a few hours of peace and safety. Ali dropped the knife into the grass beside her, falling to her knees before the stream and drinking swift and deep. Water filled the gaps in her belly left by berries and roots. She refilled her canteen, hands shaking uncontrollably. Shaking so hard she dropped the metal cap into the stream. 
she swore, plunging into the cold water up to her elbows as she fumbled for the cap, patting the rocks and slick tendrils of riverweed, begging for one solitary break. Her fingers closed on the cap as the first howl sounded through the forest. A lead and the forest went still. She had heard dogs baying, had listened to the unearthly choruses of wolves when she'd been hauled from Parenth down to Morath. This was neither. This was... There had been nights in Morath when she'd been yanked from sleep because of howls like that. Howls she'd believed were imagined when they didn't sound again. No one ever mentioned them. But there was that sound. The sound. We shall create wonders that will make the world tremble. Oh gods. Alid blindly screwed the cap onto the canteen. Whatever it might be, it was closing in fast. Maybe a tree. High up in a tree. Maybe save her. Might save her. Hide her. Maybe. Alid twisted to shove her canteen into her bag. But a warrior was crouched across the stream. A long, wicked knife balanced on his knee. His black eyes devoured her, his face harsh beneath equally dark shoulder-length hair, as he said in a voice like granite, Unless you want to be lunch, girl, I suggest you come with me. A small, ancient voice whispered in her ear that she'd at last found her relentless hunter, and they'd now both become someone else's prey. Lork and Salvatare listened to the rising snarls in the ancient wood and knew they were likely about to die. Well, the girl was about to die, either at the claws of whatever pursued them or at the end of Lorcan's blade. He hadn't yet decided. Human. The cinnamon and elderberry scent of her was utterly human. And yet that other smell remained, that tinge of darkness fluttering about her like a hummingbird's wings. He might have suspected she'd summoned the beasts were it not for the tang of fear staining the air. And for the fact that he'd been tracking her for three days now. Letting her lose herself in the tangled labyrinth of Oakwald. And had found little to indicate she was under vogue thrall. Lorcan rose to his feet. And her dark eyes widened as she took in his towering height. She remained kneeling by the stream. A dirty hand reaching for the dagger she'd foolishly discarded in the grass. She wasn't stupid or desperate enough to lift it against him. Who are you? Her hoarse voice was low, not sweet. High thing he'd expect, not the sweet high thing he'd expected from her delicate, fully curved frame. Low and cold and steady. If you want to die, Lorcan said, then go ahead. Keep asking questions. He turned away. Northward. And that was when the second set of snarling began, from the other direction. Two packs, closing in. Grass and cloth rustled, and when he looked, the girl was on her feet, dagger angled, face sickly pale as she realized what was happening. They were being herded. East or west, Lorcan said. In the five centuries he'd been slaughtering his way across the world, he'd never heard snarls like that from any manner of beast. He thumbed free his hatchet from where it was strapped at his side. East, the girl breathed, eyes darting to either direction. I, I was told to stay out of the mountains. Wyverns, large winged beasts, patrol them. I know what a wyvern is, he said. Some temper snapped in her dark eyes at his tone. But the fear washed it away. She began backing toward the direction she'd chosen. One of the creatures loosed a keening cry. Not a canine sound. No, this was high-pitched, screeching, like a bat, but deeper, hungrier. Run, he said. She did. Lorgan had to give the girl credit. Despite the still-injured leg, despite the exhaustion that had made her sloppy these past few days, she bolted like a doe through the trees, her terror likely leeching away any pain. Lorcan leaped the wide stream in an easy movement, closing the distance between them in mere heartbeats slow. These humans were so damned slow. Her breathing was already ragged as she hauled herself up a hill, making enough noise to alert the trackers. Crashing from the brush behind them, from the south, two or three from the sound of it, big from the snapping branches and thudding of footfalls. The girl hit the top of the hill, stumbling. 
She stayed upright, and Lorcan eyed the leg again. There was no point in having tracked her for so long if she died now. <clears throat> for a heartbeat, he contemplated the weight in his jacket, the word key tucked away. His magic was strong, the strongest of any demi fey male in any kingdom, any realm. But if he used the key... If he used the key, then he'd deserve the damnation it'd called down upon him. So Lorcan flung out a net of his power behind them, an invisible barrier wafting back tendrils of wind wafting black tendrils of wind. The girl stiffened, whipping her head to him as the power rippled away in a wave. Her skin blanched further, but she continued, half falling, half running down the hill. The impact of four massive bodies against his magic struck a moment later. The tang of her blood as she sliced herself open on a rock and root shoved itself up his nose. She was nowhere near fast enough. Lorcan opened his mouth to order her to hurry when the invisible wall snapped. Not snapped, but cracked, as if those beasts had cleaved it. Impossible. No one could get through those shields. Not even Rowan Wedding Whitethorn. But sure enough, the magic had been sundered. The girl hit the gully at the bottom of the hill, near sobbing at the flat expanse of forest sprawling ahead. She sprinted, dark braid thrashing, pack bouncing against her slim back. Lorcan moved after her, eyeing the trees to either side as the snarling and rustling began again. They were being herded. But toward what? And if these things had ripped his magic apart? It had been a long, long while since he'd had a new enemy to study. To break. Keep going, he growled, and the girl didn't so much as look over her shoulder as Lorcan slammed to a stop between two towering oaks. He'd been spiraling down into his magic for days, planning to use it on the human, but not, girl, when he grew bored of stalking her. Now, his body was rife with it, the power aching to get out. Lorcan flipped his axe in his hand, once, twice, the metal singing through the d dense forest. A chill wind edged in black mist danced between the fingers of his other hand. Not wind like white thorns, and not light and flame like white thorns bitch queen. Not even raw magic like the new king of Adderlin. No, Lorcan's magic was that of will, of death and thought and destruction. There was no name for it. Not even his queen had known what it was, where it had come from. A gift from the dark god, from Hellas. Maeve had mused, a dark gift for her dark warrior, and left it at that. A wild smile danced on Lorcan's lips as he let his magic rise to the surface, let its black roar fill his veins. He had crumbled cities with his power. He did not think these beasts, however fell, would fare much better. They slowed as they closed in, sensing a predator was waiting, sizing him up. For the first time in a damn long while, Lorcan had no words for what he saw. Maybe he should have killed the girl. Death at his hand would be a mercy compared to what snarled before him. Crouching low on massive, flesh-shredding claws. Not a word, hound. No, these things were far worse. Their skin was a mottled blue, so dark as to be almost black. Each long, lightly muscled limb had been ruthlessly crafted and honed. For the long claws at the end of their hands... Five fingered hands, now curled at, as if in anticipation of a strike. But it was not their bodies that stunned him. It was the way the creatures halted, smiling beneath their slap smashed in bat like noses to reveal double rolls of needle like teeth, and then stood on their hind legs, stood to their full height as a crawling man might rise. They dwarfed him by a foot at least. And the physical attributes that seemed unnervingly familiar were confirmed when the one closest to him opened its hideous mouth and said, We have not tasted your kind's flesh yet. Lorcan's axe twitched up. I can't say I've had the pleasure either. There were very, very few beasts who could speak in the tongue of mortal and fey. Most had developed it through magic, ill-gained or blessed. But there... Slitted with pleasure and anticipation of violence, gleamed dark human eyes. Whitethorn had warned of what was occurring in Morath, 
had mentioned the word hounds might be the first of many awful things to be unleashed. Lorcan hadn't realized those things would be nearly eight feet tall and part human, part whatever Erewhon had done to the turn it into this. The closest one dared a step, but hissed. Hissed at the invisible, li invisible line he'd drawn. Lorcan's power flickered and throbbed at the poisoned claw tips of the creature as it prodded the shield. Four against one. Usually easy odds for him. Usually. But he bore the word he they sought, and that golden ring he'd stolen from Maeve, then given to and stolen from Aelin Galathinius, Anthril's ring. And if they brought either to their master, then Erewhon would possess all three word keys, and would be able to open a door between worlds to unleash his awaiting Volg hordes upon them all. And as for Anthril's golden ring, Lorgan had no doubt Erewhon would destroy the ring forged by Mala herself, the one object in Aurelia that granted immunity to its bearer against Wordstone, and the Volg. So Lorcan moved, faster than even he could detect. Even they could detect. He hurled his axe at the creature farthest from him. Its focus pinned on its companion as it prodded its shield. They all whirled toward their companion as the axe slammed into its neck, deep and permanent. All turned away to see it fall. Lethal by nature, but untrained. The beast's attention diverted for a heartbeat. Lorcan's next two knives flew, both blades embedded to the hilt in their rigid foreheads, their heads reeling back as the blows sent them clattering to their knees. The one in the center, the one who had spoken, loosed a primal scream that set Lorcan's ears ringing. It lunged for the shield. It rebounded, the magic denser this time. Lorcan drew his long sword and a knife, and could only watch as the thing roared at the shield and slammed against it with both ruined, clawed hands. And his magic, his shield, melted under its touch. It stepped through his shield like it was a doorway. Now we'll play. Lorcan crouched into a defensive stance, wondering how far the girl had made it, if she'd even turned to look at what pursued them. The sounds of her flight had faded away. Behind the creature, its companions were twitching. No. Reviving. They each lifted a strong, clawed hand to the daggers through their skulls and yanked them out. Metal rasped on bone. Only the one with its head now attached by a few tendons remained down. Beheading them, even if it meant getting close enough to do so. The creature before him smiled in savage delight. What are you? Lorcan ground out. The two others were now on their feet, the wounds in their heads already healed bristling with menace. We are hunters for his dark majesty, the leader said with a mock bow. We are the Ilkin, and we have been sent to retrieve our quarry. Those witches had dispatched these beasts for him? Cowards not to do their own hunting. The Ilkin went on, stepping toward him on legs that had that bent backward. We were going to let you have a quick death, a gift, its broad nostrils flared, scenting the silent forest. But as you have stood between us and our prey, we will savor your long end. Not him. He was not what the wyverns had been stalking these days. What these creatures had come to claim. They had no idea what he bore. Who he was. What do you want with her? He asked, monitoring the creeping approach of the three. It is none of your concern, the leader said. If there's a reward in it, I'll help you. Dark, soulless eyes flashed toward him. You do not protect the girl? Lorcan gave a shrug, praying they couldn't scent his bluff as he bought her more time. Bought himself time to work out the puzzle of their power. I don't even know her name. The three Ilkin looked at one another, a glance of question and decision. Their leader said, She is important to our king. Retrieve her, and he will fill you with power far greater than feeble shields. Was that the price for the humans they'd once been? Magic that was somehow immune to what flowed naturally in this world? Or had the choice been taken from them, as surely as their souls had been stolen too? 
Why is she important? They were now within spitting range. He wondered how long it'd take to replenish the supply of whatever power allowed them to cleave through magic. Perhaps they were buying themselves time, too. The Ilkin said. She is a thief and a murderer. She must be brought to our king for justice. Lorcan could have sworn an invisible hand touched his shoulder. He knew that touch. Had trusted it his entire life. It had kept him alive this long. A touch on his back to go forward. To fight and kill and breathe in death. A touch on his shoulder to instead run. To know that only doom waited ahead and life lay behind. The Ilkin smiled once more, its teeth bright in the gloom of the wood. As if in answer, a scream shattered from the forest behind him. And that was chapter 9 of Empire of Storms. Oh, my nose is really bothering me. Is she making biscuits? Yeah. My cat is 15 pounds. So when she makes biscuits, she puts all 15 pounds of her weight into you. It is not a pleasant feeling. Oh, my nose is really bothering me. Also, static electricity is high in this household. Annoyingly, which also does not help my nose issue. Okay. Uh, can't forget to write down the time. Also, quick announcement, we are now over 800 subscribers on YouTube. Which is insane. So thank you everyone who has subscribed on YouTube. It's absolutely insane. The last time I checked, we were at 806, I believe. So that means we have less than 200 subscribers to go before we are able to get monetized. And that just blows my mind. Anyways. On to chapter 10 of Emperor of Storms. Elid Locken stood before a creature birthed from a dark god's nightmares. Across the clearing, it towered over her, its talons digging into the loam of the forest floor. There you are. It hissed, through teeth sharper than a fish's. Come with me, girl, and I will grant you a quick end. Lies. She saw how it sized her up, claws curling as if it could already feel them shredding into her soft belly. The thing had appeared in her path as if a cloud of night had dropped it there. It had laughed when she screamed. Her knife shook as she raised it. It stood like a man, spoke like one. And its eyes... Utterly soulless, yet the shape of them. They were human, too. Monstrous, what terrible mind had dreamed up such a thing? She knew the answer. Help. She needed help. But that man from the stream was likely dead at the claws of the other beasts. She wondered how long that magic of his had held out. The creature stepped toward her, its muscled legs closing the distance too quickly. She backed toward the trees, the direction she'd come from. Is your blood as sweet as your face, girl? Its grayish tongue tasted the air between them. Think, think, think. What would Manon do before such a creature? Manon, she remembered, came equipped with claws and fangs of her own. But a small voice whispered in her ear. So do you. Use what you have. There were other weapons than those made of iron and steel. Though her knees shook, Elid lifted her chin and met the black human eyes of the creature. Careful, she said, dropping her voice into the purr Manon had so often used to frighten the wits out of everyone. Elid reached into the pocket of her coat, pulling out the shard of stone and clutching it in her fist, willing that otherworldly presence to fill the clearing, the world. She prayed the creature wouldn't look at her fist, wouldn't ask what was in it, as she drawled. Do you think the Dark King will be pleased if you harm me? She looked down her nose at it, or as best as she could while standing several feet shorter. 
I have been sent to look for the girl. Do not interfere. The creature seemed to recognize the fighting leathers then, seemed to scent that strange, off scent surrounding the rock, and it hesitated. Lieb kept her face a mask of cold displeasure. Get out of my sight. She almost vomited as she began stalking toward it, toward sure death. But she stomped along, prowling as Manon had so often done. Alid made herself look up into the bat-like, hideous face as she passed. Tell your brethren that if you interfere again, I will personally oversee what delights you experience upon Morath's tables. Doubt still danced in its eyes, along with real fear. A lucky guess, those words and phrases, based on what she'd overheard. She didn't let herself consider what had been done to make such a creature quake at the mention. Alid was five paces from the creature, keenly aware that her spine was now vulnerable to those shredding claws and teeth when it asked. Why did you flee at our approach? She said without turning in that cold, vicious voice of Manon Blackbeak. I do not tolerate the questions of underlings. You have already disrupted my hunt and injured my ankle with your useless attack. Pray that I do not remember your face when I return to the keep. She knew her mistake the moment it sucked in a hissing breath. Still, she kept her legs moving, back straight. What a coincidence, it mused, that our prey is similarly lamed. Aneth save her. Perhaps it had unnoticed the limp until then. Fool. Fool. Running would do her no good. Running would proclaim the creature had won, that it was right. She halted, as if her temper had yanked on a leash, and snapped her face toward the creature. What is it you're hissing about? Utter conviction. Utter rage. Again, the creature paused. One chance. Just one chance. It learned soon enough that it had been duped. Elite held its gaze. It was like staring a dead snake in the eyes. She said with that lethal quiet the witches like to use. Do not make me reveal what his dark majesty put inside me on that table. As if in response, the stone in her hand throbbed, and she could have sworn darkness flickered. The creature shuddered, backing away a step. Lee didn't consider what she held as she sneered one last time and stalked away. She made it perhaps half a mile before the forest was again full of chittering life. She fell to her knees and vomited. Nothing but bile and water came out. She was so busy hurling up her guts with stupid fear and relief that she didn't notice anyone's approach until it was too late. A broad hand clamped on her shoulder, whirling her around. She drew her dagger, but too slowly. The same hand released her to snap, slap the blade into the grass. Elide found herself staring into the dirt-splattered face of the man from the stream. No, not dirt. Blood that reeked. Black blood. How, she said, stumbling away a step. You first, he snarled, but whipped his head toward the forest behind them. She followed his gaze, saw nothing. When she looked at his harsh face, a sword lay against her throat. She tried to fall back, but he gripped her arm, holding her as steel bit into her skin. Why do you smell of one of them? Why do they chase you? She'd pocketed the stone, or else she might have shown him. But movement might cause him to, sh to strike. And that small voice whispered to keep that stone concealed. She offered another truth. Because I've spent the past several months in Morath, living amongst that scent. They seek me because I managed to get free. I flee north. To safety. Faster than she could see, he lowered his blade. Only to slice it across her arm. A scratch, barely more than a whisper of pain. They both watched as her red blood surged and dribbled. It seemed to answer enough for him. You can call me Lorkin, he said, though she hadn't asked. And with that, he hauled her over his broad shoulder like a sack of potatoes and ran. Alid knew two things within seconds. That the remaining creatures, however many there were, had to be on their tail, on their trail and closing fast. Had to have realized she'd bluffed her way free. And that the man, moving swift as a wind between the oaks, 
was Demifei. Lorcan ran and ran, his lungs gobbling down great gulps of the forest's stifling air. Slung over his shoulder, the girl didn't even whimper as the miles passed. He'd carried packs heavier than her over entire mountain ranges. Lorcan slowed when his strength at last began to flag, spent quicker thanks to the magic he used to get those three beasts into his stranglehold, battering past their natural-born immunity to it, then killed two while he'd pinned the other long enough to sprint for the girl. He'd been lucky. The girl, it seemed, had been smart. He jogged into a stop, setting her down hard enough that she winced, winced and hopped a bit on that hurt ankle. Her blood had flowed red instead of that reeking black that implied Vogue possession. But it still didn't explain how she'd been able to intimidate that Ilkin into submission. Where are we going? She said, swinging her pack to pull out her canteen. He waited for the tears and prayers and begging. She just unscrewed the cap of the leather-coated container and swigged deep. Then, to his surprise, offered him some. Lorcan didn't take it. She merely drank again. We're going to the edge of the forest, to the Acanthus River. Where, where are we? The hesitation said enough. She'd calculated the risk of revealing how vulnerable she was with that question. And decided she was too desperate for the answer. What is your name? Marion. She held his gaze with a sort of unflinching steel that had him angling his head. An answer for an answer, he said. We're in the middle of Otterlin. You are about a day's hike from the Avery River. Marion blinked. He wondered if she even knew that, or had considered how she'd crossed the mighty body of water that had cha claimed ships captained by the most seasoned of men and women. She said, Are we running, or can I sit for a moment? He listened to the sounds of the forest for any hint of danger, then jerked his chin. Marion sighed as she sat on the moss and roots. She surveyed him. I thought all the Fae were dead, even the demi -fay. I'm from Wendelin, and you, he said, brows rising slightly, are from Morath. Not from, escaping from. Why and how? Her narrow eyes told him enough. She knew he still didn't believe her, not entirely, red blood or no. Yet she didn't answer, instead leaning over her legs to unlace a boot. Her fingers trembled a bit, but she got through the laces, yanking off the boot, removing the sock, and rolling up her leather pant leg to reveal. Shit. He'd seen plenty of ruined bodies in his day, had done plenty of ruining himself, but barely were they left so untreated. Marion's leg was a mess of scar tissue and twisted bone, and right above her misshapen ankle lay still healing wounds where shackles had unmistakably been. She said quietly, Allies of Morath are usually whole. Their dark magic could surely cure a cripple, and they surely would have no use for one. That was why she'd managed so well with the limp. She'd had years to master it, from the coloring of the scar tissue. Marion rolled her pant leg back down, but left her foot bare, massaging it. She hissed through her teeth. He sat on a fallen log a few feet away, taking off his own pack to rifle through it. Tell me what you know of Morath, he said, and chucked her a tin of salve straight from Doranel. The girl stared at it, those sharp eyes putting together what he was, where he was from, and what that tin likely contained. When she lifted them to his face, when she lifted them to his face, she nodded silently in agreement of his offer, relief from the pain for answers. She unscrewed the lid, and he caught the way her mouth parted as she breathed in the pungent herbs. Pain and pleasure danced across her face as she began rubbing the salve into her old injuries. And as she worked, she spoke. Marion told him of the Iron Teeth host, of the wing leader and the thirteen, of the armies camped around the mountain keep, of the places where only screaming echoed, of the countless forges and blacksmiths. She described her own escape, without warning. She didn't know how. The castle had exploded. She'd seen it as her chance, disguising herself in a witch's attire, grabbing one of their packs and running. In the chaos, no one had chased her. I've been running for weeks, she said, 
Apparently, I've barely covered half the distance. To where? Marion looked northward. Terrison. Lorcan stifled a snarl. You're not missing much. Have you news of it? Alarm filled those eyes. No, he said, shrugging. She finished rub rubbing her foot and ankle. What's in Terrison? Your family? He had not asked why she'd been brought to Morath. Ha he didn't particularly care to hear her sad story. Everyone had one, he'd found. The girl's face tightened. I owe a debt to a friend, someone who helped me get out of Morath. She bade me to find someone named Selena Sardothian. So that is my first task, learning who she is, where she is. Terrison seems like a better place to start than Adderlin. No guile, no whisper of this meeting being anything but chance. And then, the girl went on, the brightness in her eyes growing. I need to find Aelin Galathinius, the Queen of Terrison. It was an effort not to go for his sword. Why? Marion glanced toward him, as if she'd somehow even forgotten he was there. I heard a rumor that she's raising an army to stop the one in Morath. I plan to offer my services. Why? He said again. Aside from the wits that had kept her out of the Ilkin's claws, he saw no other reason for the bitch queen to need the girl. Marion's full mouth tightened. Because I am from Terrasen. And believed my queen dead. And now she is alive and fighting. So I will fight with her. So that no other girls will be taken from their homes and brought to Morath and forgotten. Lorcan debated telling her what he knew. That our two quests were one and the same. But that would lead to questions from her. And he was in no mood. Why do you wish to go to Morath? Everyone else is fleeing from it. I was sent by my mistress to stop the threat it poses. You're one man, male. Not an insult, but Lorcan stared her down anyway. I have my skills, just as you have yours. Her eyes darted to his hands, now crusted in dried black blood. He wondered, though, if she was imagining the magic that had sparked there. He waited for Marion to ask more, but she pulled on her sock, then her boot, and laced it up. We shouldn't rest for long. Indeed. She eased to her feet, wincing a bit, but gave an appreciative frown toward her leg. Lorcan took that as answer enough regarding the solve's efficiency. She bent down to retrieve the tin, her dark curtain of hair sweeping over her face. At some point, it had come free of its braid. She rose, chucking him the tin. He caught it in one hand. Once we reach the acanthus, what then? He pocketed the tin in his cloak. There are countless merchants, caravans, and seasonal carnivals wandering the plains. I passed many on my way down here. Some might even be trying to cross the river. We'll get in with one of them, hide out. Once we've crossed and wandered far enough onto the grasslands, you'll take one north. I'll head south. Her eyes narrowed slightly, but Marion said, Why travel with me at all? There are more details regarding Morath's interior that I want from you. I'll keep you from danger, and you'll provide them for me. The sun began its final descent, bathing the woods in gold. Marion frowned slightly. You swear it, that you will protect me? I didn't leave you to the Ilkin today, did I? She eyed him with a clarity and frankness that made him pause. Swear it. He rolled his eyes. I promise. The girl had no idea that for the past five centuries, promises were the only currency he really traded in. I will not abandon you. She nodded, seemingly satisfied with that. Then I will tell you what I know. He started eastward, slinging his pack over his shoulder. But Marion said, They'll be hunting for us at every crossing, searching wagons. If they could find me here, they'll find me on any main road. And find him, too, if the witches were still out for his blood. Lorcan said, And you have some idea around this? A faint smile danced around her rosebud mouth, despite the horrors they'd escaped. Her misery in the woods. I might. And that was chapter 10 of Empire of Storms.
Ugh. If my nose could quit itching, dude, I would pay money for my nose to quit itching right now. And I don't have any money, so that says a lot. It is funny how it's like a, it's like, it's like when you meet somebody out and about, it's just in a random place, and you're like, wait a minute, I know you somehow, you know, or like, or you find out that you like, your parents knew each other, or like, something like that, it's, it's like a small world moment. I mean, it was like I was at the, I was at the animal shelter last weekend, and a girl was, came in there, I should say, a woman came in, and was uh, inquiring about adopting a cat. And we were standing there, and we were kind of looking at each other, and I thought she looked familiar. And then finally, like, 15 minutes go by, and she approaches me, and she's like, You look familiar! And I was like, Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And we st sat there for a minute, and she goes, Did you go to Walsh? Which is the college I went to. And I was like, Oh my gosh, yes, we've had- we had several classes together at Walsh. That's um, crazy. yeah, so it was a little- small world. Small world. I don't know if she ended up walking home with a cat that day, but... I need another sip of water. It's like the more I breathe, the more my nose gets itchy. I wonder if putting any lotion on it would help. Maybe. I don't have any lotion I could put on my nose. Yeah, I would be huffing shit at that point. Because all of my hand lotion is super scented. I'll put on some chap chapstick. Wipe some on your nose. It's gonna sound silly, That's what I was gonna it's... do. Oh. Sometimes giving it that moisture helps. And I'm hoping maybe the scent will also distract me from the tickling and the itching. It's not like, it's like, it's like, it's medicated chapstick. So it's got that medication smell. I don't know how to describe it. It's not like a strong smell, but it's like, it's not Vaseline. It's, it's something else. Yeah. And I can guarantee you it's from all the static electricity and dry air. <clears throat> okay, on to chapter four of Tower of Dawn. Because, by the way, we're switching over to Tower of Dawn now. If any of y'all were reading along with. Of all the rooms in the Torre Chesme, Irene Towers loved this one best. Perhaps it was because the room, located in the very pinnacle of the stone, pale stone tower, and its sprawling complex below, had unparalleled views of the sunset over Antica. Perhaps it was because this was the place where she'd felt the first shred of safety in nearly ten years. The place she had first looked upon the ancient woman, now sitting across the paper and book strewn desk, and heard the words that changed everything. You are welcome here, Irene Towers. It had been over two years since then. Two years of working here, living here, in this tower, and in this city of so many peoples, so many foods and cachets of knowledge. It had been all she would dreamed it would be, and she had seized every opportunity, every challenge with both hands, had studied and listened and practiced and saved lives, changed them until she had climbed to the very top of her class until an unknown healer's daughter from Fenhera was approached by healers old and young who had trained their entire lives for her advice and assistance the magic helped glorious lovely magic that could make her breathless or so tired she couldn't get out of bed for days magic demanded a cost to both healer and patient but Irene was willing to pay it she had never minded the aftermath of a brutal healing, if it meant saving a life. Silva had granted her a gift, 
and a young stranger had given her another gift. That final night in Inish two years ago. Irene had no plans to waste either. She waited in silence as the slender woman across from her finished reading through some message on her chronically messy, messy desk. Despite the servant's best efforts, the ancient rosewood desk was always chaotic, covered with formulas or spells or vials and jars brewing some tonic. There were two such vials on the desk now, clear orbs atop silver feet fashioned after ibis legs being purified by the endless sunshine within the tower. Hafiza, healer on high of the Torre Chesme, plucked up one of the vials, swirled its pale blue contents, frowned, and set it down. The damned thing always takes twice as long as I anticipate, she asked casually, using Irene's own language. Why do you think that is? Irene leaned forward in the worn, tufted armchair on her side of the desk to study the tonic. Every meeting, every encounter with Hafiza was a lesson, a chance to learn, to be challenged. Irene lifted the vial from its stand, holding it to the golden light of sunset as she examined the thick azure liquid within. Use? Ten-year-old girl developed a dry cough six weeks ago. Saw the physicians, who advised honey tea, rest, and fresh air. Got better for a time, but returned a week ago with a vengeance. The physicians of the Torre Chesme were the finest in the world, distinguished only from the Torre's healers by the fact that they did not possess magic. They were the first line of inspection for the healers in the tower, their quarters occupying the sprawling complex around its base. Magic was precious. Its demands costly enough that some healer on high centuries ago had decreed that if they were to see a patient, a physician must first inspect the person. Perhaps it had been a political maneuver, a bone tossed to the physician so often passed over by a people clamoring for the cure-all remedies of magic. Yet magic could not cure all things, could not halt death or bring years or, or bring someone back from it. She learned it again and again these past two years, and earlier. And even with the protocols with the physicians, Irene still, as she had always done, found herself walking toward the sound of coughing in the narrow, sloped streets of Antica. Irene tilted the vial this way and that. The tonic might be reacting to the heat. It's but unseasonably warm, even for us. With the end of summer finally near, even after two years, Irene was still not entirely accustomed to the unrelenting dry heat of the god city. Mercifully, some long-ago mastermind had invented the Bidgier, wind-catching towers set atop buildings to draw in fresh air to the rooms below, some even working in tandem with the few underground canals winding beneath Antica to transform hot wind into cool breezes. The city was peppered with small towers, like a thousand spears jutting toward the sky, ranging from the small houses made of earthen bricks to the great domed residences full of shaded courtyards and clear pools. Unfortunately, the Torre had predated that stroke of brilliance, and though the upper levels possessed some cunning ventilation that cooled the chambers far below, there were plenty of days when Irene wished some clever architect would take it upon themselves to outfit the Torre with the latest advances. Indeed, with the rising heat and the various fires burning throughout the tower, Hafiza's room was near sweltering, which led Irene to add, You could put it in the lower chamber, where it's cooler. But the sunlight needed? Irene considered. Bring in mirrors, catch the sunlight through the window, and focus it upon the vial, adjust it a few times a day to match the path of the sun. The cooler temperature and more concentrated sunlight might have the tonic ready sooner. A little, please nod. Irene had come to cherish those nods, the light in those brown eyes. Quick wit saves lives more often than magic, was Hafiza's only reply. She'd said it a thousand times before, usually where Irene was involved, to her eternal pride. But Irene bowed her head in thanks and set the vial back upon its stand. So... Hafiza said, folding her hands atop each other on the near-glowing rosewood desk. Arisha informs me that she believes you are ready to leave us. Irene straightened in her seat, 
The very same chair she'd sat in that first day she'd climbed a thousand steps to the top of the tower and begged for admittance. The begging had been the least of her humiliations that meeting. The crowning moment being when she dumped the bag of gold on Hafiz's desk, blurting that she didn't care what the cost was and to take it all. Not realizing that Hafiza did not take money from students. No, they paid for their education in other ways. Irene had suffered through endless indignities and degradations during her year working at the Backwater White Pig Inn. But she had never been more mortified than the mo moment Hafiza ordered her to put the money back in that brown pouch, scraping the gold off the desk like some card player scrambling to collect his winnings. Irene had debated leaping right out the arc of the windows, towering behind Hafiza's desk. Much had changed since then. Gone was the homespun dress, the too slim body, though Irene supposed the endless stares of the Tory had kept in check the weight she'd gained from steady, healthy eating, thanks to the Tory's enormous kitchens, the countless markets teeming with food stalls, and the dine-in shops along every bustling street and winding alley. Irene swallowed once, trying and failing to glean the healer on High's face. Afiza had been the one person here whom Irene could never read, never anticipate. She'd never once shown a display of temper, something that couldn't be said of many of the instructors here, Arisha especially, and had never raised her voice. Haviza had only three expressions, pleased, neutral, and disappointed. Irene lived in terror of the latter two. Not for any punishment. There was no such thing here. No rations held, no pain threatened, not like at the white pig, where Nolan had docked her pay if she stepped out of line, or was over-generous with a customer, or if he caught her leaving out nightly scraps for the half-barrel urchins who had prowled the filthy streets of Inish. She'd arrived here thinking it would be the same. People who took her money, people who made it harder and harder to leave. She'd spent a year working at the White Pig due to Nolan's increases in her rent, decreases in her pay, her, his cut of her meager tips, and knowledge that most women in Inish worked the streets, and his place, disgusting as it had been, was a far better alternative. She told herself never again, until she'd arrived here, until she'd dumped that gold on Hafiz's desk and had been ready to do it all over, in debt and sell herself, just for a chance to learn. Hafiza did not even consider such things. Her work was in direct opposition to the people who did. The people like Nolan. Irene still remembered the first time she'd heard Hafiza say in that thick, lovely accent of hers. Nearly the same words that Irene's mother had told her, over and over. They did not charge, students or patients, for what Silba, goddess of healing, gifted them for free. In a land of so many gods that Irene was still struggling to keep them all straight, at least Silba remained the same. Yet another clever thing the Kaganate had done upon patching together the kingdoms and territories during their years of conquest. Keep and adapt the gods of everyone, including Silba, whose dominance over the healers had been established in these lands long ago. History was written by the victors, apparently. Or so Arisha, Irene's direct tutor, had once told her. Even the gods seemed no more immune to it than mere mortals. But it did not stop Irene from offering up a prayer to Silba, and whatever gods might be listening, as she said at last, I am ready, yes. To leave us? Such simple words, offered with that neutral face, calm and patient. Or have you considered the other option I presented to you? Irene had. She thought about it endlessly in the two weeks since Hafiza had summoned her to this office and spoke the one word that had clenched a fist around her heart. Stay. Stay and learn more. Stay and see what this fledgling life she'd built here might grow into. Irene rubbed at her chest as if she could still feel that vice-like grip. War is coming to my home again, the northern continent, so they called it here. Irene swallowed. I want to be there to help those fighting against the Empire's control. At last... After so many years, a force was rallying. Adderlin itself had been sundered, if rumors were to be believed, by Dorian Havilliard in the north and the dead king's second, Duke Parrington in the south. Dorian was backed by Aelin Galathinius, the long-lost queen now ripe with power and ravenous for vengeance, judging by what she'd done to the glass castle and its king. 
and Parrington, rumor also claimed, was aided by horrors birthed from some dark nightmare. But if this was the only chance at freedom for Fenharrow, Irene would be there to help, in whatever way she could. She still smelled smoke late at night or when she was drained after a hard healing. Smoke from the that fire those Adderlanian soldiers had built and burned her mother upon. She still heard her mother screaming and felt the wood of that tree trunk dig beneath her nails as she'd hidden at the edge of the oak wall. As she watched them burn her mother alive, after her mother had killed that soldier to buy Irene time to run. It had been ten years since then, nearly eleven, and though she had crossed mountains and oceans, there were some days when Irene felt as if there, she were still standing in Fenharrow, smelling that fire, splinters slicing under her nails, watching as the soldiers took their torches and burned her cottage too. The cottage that had housed generations of Tower's healers. Irene supposed it was fitting, somehow, she'd wound up in a tower herself, with only the ring on her left hand as proof that once, for hundreds of years, there had existed a line of prodigally gifted female healers in the south of Fenharrow, a ring she now toyed with, that last shred of proof that her mother and mother's mother and all the mothers before them had once lived and healed in peace. It was the first of only two objects Irene would not sell even before selling herself. Hafiza had not replied, and so Irene went on, the sun sinking farther toward the jade waters of the harbor across the city. Even with magic now returned to the northern continent, many of the healers might not have the training, if any survived at all. I could save many lives. War could also claim your life. She knew this. Irene lifted her chin. I am aware of the risks. Hafiz's dark eyes softened. Yes, yes you are. It had come out during that first mortifying meeting with the healer on high. Irene had not cried for years, since that day her mother had become ash on the wind. And yet the moment Hafiza had asked about Irene's parents, she had buried her face in her hands and wept. Hafiza had come from around that desk and held her, rubbing her back in soothing circles. Hafiza often did that. Not just to Irene, but to all the, her healers. When the hours were long and their backs had cramped and the magic had taken everything, and it was still not enough. A quiet, steady presence who steeled them, soothed them. Hafiza was as close to a mother as Irene had found since she was eleven. And now weeks away from twenty-two, she doubted she'd ever find another like her. I have taken the examinations. Irene said, even though Hafiza knew that already. She'd given them to Irene herself, overseeing the grueling week of tests on knowledge, skill, and actual human practice. Irene had made sure she received the highest marks of her class, as near to a perfect score as anyone had ever been given here. I'm ready. Indeed you are, and yet I still wonder how much you might learn in five years. Ten years! if you have already learned so much in two. Irene had been too skilled to begin with the acolytes in the lower levels of the Torre. She'd shadowed her mother since she was old enough to walk and talk, learning slowly, over the years, as all the healers in her family had done. At eleven, Irene had learned more than most would in another decade, and even during the six years that had followed, where she'd pretended to be an ordinary girl while working on her mother's cousin's farm, the family unsure what to really do with her, unwilling to get to know her when war in Adderland might destroy them all. She quietly practiced, but not too much, not too noticeably. During those years, neighbor had sold out neighbor for even the whisper of magic. And even though magic had vanished, taking Silva's gift with it, Irene had been careful never to appear more than a simple farmer's relative whose grandmother had perhaps taught her a few natural remedies for fevers, or birthing pain, or sprained and broken limbs. In Inish, she'd been able to do more, using her sparse pocket money to purchase herbs, salves. But she didn't often dare, not with Nolan and Jessa, his favorite barmaid, watching her day and night. So these past two years, she'd wanted to learn as much as she could. But it had also been an unleashing, of years of stifling, of lying and hiding. And that day she'd walked off the boat and felt her magic stir? Felt it reach for a man limping down the street? 
She had fallen into a state of shock that had not ended until she wound up weeping in this very chair three hours later. Irene sighed through her nose. I could return here one day to continue my studies, but with all due respect, I am a full healer now. And she could venture wherever her gift called her. Hafiz's white brows rose, stark against her brown skin. And what of Prince Caution? Irene shifted in her seat. What of him? You were once good friends. He remains fond of you, and that is no small thing to ignore. Irene leveled a look few dared to direct toward the healer on high. Will he interfere with my plans to leave? He is a prince, and has been denied nothing, save for the crown he conveys. Covet. He may find that your leaving is not something he will tolerate. Dread sluiced through her, starting at her spine and ending curled deep in her gut. I have given him no encouragement. I made my thoughts on that matter perfectly clear last year. It had been a disaster. She'd gone over it again and again. The things she'd said. The moments between them. Everything that had led up to that awful conversation in that large, darkened tent atop the windswept steps. It had started a few months after she'd arrived in Antica, when one of Caution's favored servants had fallen ill. To her surprise, the prince himself had been at the man's bedside, and during the long hours Irene worked, the conversation had flowed, and she'd found herself smiling. She'd cured the servant, and upon leaving that night, she'd been escorted by Caution himself to the gates of the Torre. And in the months that followed, friendship had sprung up between them. Perhaps freer, lighter than the friendship she also wound up forming with Asar, who had taken a liking to Irene after requiring some healing of her own. And while Irene had struggled to find companions within the Torre, thanks to her and her fellow students' conflicting hours, the prince and princess had become friends indeed. And had Hussar's, as had Hussar's lover, the sweet-faced Renya, who was as lovely inside as she was out. A strange group they made, but Irene had enjoyed their company, the dinners Caution and Hussar invited her to, when Irene knew she had no reason to really be there. Caution often managed to find a way to sit next to her, or near enough to engage her in conversation. For months, things had been fine, better than fine. And then Hafiza had brought Irene out to the steps, the native home of the Kagan's family, to oversee a grueling healing, with Caution as their escort and guide. The healer on high now examined Irene, frowning slightly. Perhaps your lack of encouragement has made him more eager. Irene rubbed her eyebrows with her thumb and forefinger. We've barely spoken since then. It was true, though mostly due to Irene avoiding him at the dinners to which Hussar and Renya still invited her. The prince does not seem like a man easily deterred, certainly not in matters of the heart. She knew that. She liked that about Caution, until he'd wanted something she couldn't give him. Irene groaned a bit. Will I have to leave like a thief in the night, then? Hussar would never forgive her, though she had no doubt Renya would try to soothe and rationalize it to the princess. If Hussar was pure flame, then Renya was flowing water. Should you decide to remain, you will not have to worry about such things at all. Irene straightened. You would really use caution as a way to keep me here? Hafiza laughed, a crow of warmth. No, but forgive an old woman for trying to use any avenue necessary to convince you. Pride and guilt eddied in her chest. But Irene said nothing, had no answer. Returning to the northern continent, she knew there was no one and nothing left for her, there for her. Nothing but unforgiving war and those who would need her help. She did not even know where to go, where to sail, how to find those armies and their wounded. She'd traveled far and wide before, had evaded enemies bent on slaughtering her, and the thought of doing it all again. She knew some would think her mad, ungrateful for the offer her visa had laid before her. She thought those things of herself for a long while now. Yet not a single day passed without Irene gazing toward the sea at the foot of the city, gazing northward. Irene's attention indeed slid from the healer on high to the windows behind her, to the distant, darkening horizon, as if it were a lodestone. Hafiza said, a shade more gently, 
There is no rush to decide. Wars take a long time. But I will need... There is a task I would first have you do, Irene. Irene stilled at that tone. The hint of command in it. She glanced to the letter Hafiza had been reading when she'd entered. What is it? There is a guest at the palace. A special guest of the Kagan. I would ask you to treat him before you decide whether now is the right time to leave these shores, or if it is better to remain. Irene angled her head. Rare, very rare for Hafiza to pass off a task from the Kagan to someone else. What is his ailment? Common, standard words for healers receiving cases. He is a young man, aged 23, healthy in every regard, in fit condition, but he suffered a grave injury to his spine earlier this summer that left him paralyzed from the hips downward. He cannot feel or move his legs and has been in a wheeled chair since. I am bypassing the initial physician's examination to appeal directly to you. Irene's mind churned. A complex, long process to heal that manner of injury. Spines were nearly as difficult as brains, connected to them quite closely. With that sort of healing, it wasn't a matter of letting her magic wash over them. That wasn't how it worked. It was finding the right places and channels, and finding the correct amount of magic to wield. It was getting the brain to again send signals to the spine, down those broken pathways. It was replacing the damaged, smallest kernels of life within the body with new, fresh ones. And on top of it, learning to walk again. Weeks. Months, perhaps. He is an active young man, Hafiza said. The injury is akin to the warrior you aided last winter on the steps. She'd guessed as much already. It was likely why she'd been asked. Two months spent healing the horse lord who'd taken a bad fall off his mount and injured his spine. It was not an uncommon injury among the Dargan, some of whom rode horses and some of whom soared on rooks, and they had long relied on the Tori's healers. Working on the warrior had been her first time putting her lessons on the subject into effect, precisely why Hafiza had accompanied her to the steps. Irene was fairly confident she could do another healing on her own this time. But it was the way Hafiza glanced down at the letter, just once, that made Irene pause, made her ask. Who is he? Lord Kaol Westfall. Not a name from the Kaganate. Hafiza added, holding Irene's gaze. He was the former captain of the guard, and is now hand to the new king of Adolin. Silence. Irene was silent, in her head, her heart. Only the, the crying of the gulls sailing above the Torre, and the shouts of vendors going home for the night in the streets beyond the compound's high walls filled the tower room. No. The word pushed out of Irene on a breath. Hafiza's slim mouth tightened. No, Irene said again. I will not heal him. There was no softness, nothing motherly in Hafiza's face as she said. You took an oath upon entering these halls. No. It was all she could think to say. I am well aware how difficult it may be for you. Her hands started shaking. No. Why? You know why. The words were a strangled whisper. You, you, you know. If you see an Adderlanian soldiers suffering on those battlefields, will you stomp right over them? It was the cruelest Hafiza had ever been to her. Irene rubbed the ring on her finger. If he was captain of the guard for the last king, he... He worked for the man who... The words spilled and stumbled out. He took orders from him. And now works for Dorian Havilio. Who indulged in his father's riches. The riches of my people. Even if Dorian Havilio did not participate, the fact that he stood back while it happened... The pale stone walls pressed in, even the solid tower beneath them feeling unwieldy. Do you know what the king's men did these years? What his armies, his soldiers, his guards did? And you ask me to heal a man who commanded them? It is a reality of who you are, who we are, a choice all healers must make. And you have made it so often. In your peaceful kingdom? Hafiza's face darkened. 
not with ire, but memory. I was once asked to heal a man who was injured while evading capture, after he had committed a crime so unspeakable. The guards told me what he'd done before I walked into his cell. They wanted him patched up so he could live to be put on trial. He undoubtedly, he'd undoubtedly be executed. They had victims willing to testify, and proof of plenty. Arisha herself saw the latest victim, his last one, gathered all the evidence she needed, and stood in that court and condemned him with what she had seen. Aviza's throat bobbed. They chained him down in that cell, and he was hurt enough that I knew. I knew I could use my magic to make the internal bleeding worse. They'd never know. They'd be dead. He'd be dead by morning. And no one would dare question me. She studied the vial of blue tonic. It was the closest I have ever come to killing. I wanted to kill him for what he had done. The world would be better for it. I had my hands on his chest. I was ready to do it. But I remembered. I remembered that oath I had taken. And remembered that they had asked me to heal him so that he would live. So that justice might be found for his victims. And their families. She met Irene's eyes. It was not my death to dole out. What happened? The words were a wobble. He tried to plead innocent. Even with what Arisha presented. With what the victim was willing to talk about. He was a monster through and through. They convicted him. And he was executed at sunrise the next day. Did you watch it? I did not. I came back up here. But Arisha did. She stood at the front of the crowd and stayed until they hauled his corpse into a cart. She stayed for the victims who could not bear to watch. Then she returned here, and we both cried for a long, long while. Irene was quiet for a few breaths, enough that her hands steadied. So I am to heal this man, so he might find justice elsewhere? You do not know his story, Irene. I suggest listening to it before contemplating such things. Irene shook her head. There will be no justice for him. Not if he served the old and new king. Not if he's cunning enough to remain in power. I know how Adderlin works. Hafiza watched her for a long moment. The day you walked into this room, so terribly thin and covered with the dust of a hundred roads. I had never sensed such a gift. I looked into those beautiful eyes of yours, and I nearly gasped at the uncut power in you. Disappointment. It was disappointment on the healer on High's face, and her voice. I thought to myself, Apisa went on, where has this young woman been hiding? What god reared you, guided you to my doorstep? Your dress was in tatters around your ankles, and yet you walked in, straight-backed as any noble lady as if you were the heir to Kamala herself. Until Irene had dumped the money on the desk and fallen apart moments later. She doubted the very first healer on high had ever done such a thing. Even your family name, Powers, a hint at your foremother's long ago association with the Torre, perhaps. I wondered in that moment if I had at last found my heir, my replacement. Irene felt the words like a blow to the gut. Hafiza had never so much as hinted. Stay, the healer on high had offered, to not only continue the training, but also take up the mantle now laid before her. But it had not been Irene's own ambition to one day claim this room as her own. Not when her sights had always been set across the narrow sea. And even now. It was an honor beyond words, yes, but one that rang hollow. I asked what you wanted to do with the knowledge I would give you, Hafiza went on. Do you remember what you said to me? Irene did. She had not forgotten it for a moment. I said I wanted to use it to do some good for the world, to do something with my useless, wasted life. The words had guided her these years, along with the note she carried every day, moving it from pocket to pocket, dress to dress, words from a mysterious stranger, perhaps a god, who had worn the skin of a battered young woman, whose gift of gold had gotten her here, saved her. And so you shall, Irene, Hafiza said. 
You shall one day return home, and you shall do good. You shall do wonders. But before you do, I would ask this of you. Help that young man. You have done the healing before. You can do it again now. Why can't you? She never sounded so sullen, so ungrateful. Hafiza gave her a small, sad smile. It is not my own healing that is needed. Irene knew the healer on high did not mean the man's healing, either. She swallowed against the thickness in her throat. It is a soul wound, Irene, and letting it fester these years. I cannot blame you, but I will hold you accountable if you let it turn into something worse, and I will mourn you for it. Irene's lips wobbled, but she pressed them together, blinking back the burning in her eyes. You passed the tests better than anyone who has ever climbed into this tower, Hafiza said softly. But let this be my personal test for you, the final one, so that when you decide to go, I may bid you farewell, send you off to war, and know. Hafiza put a hand on her chest. Know that wherever the road takes you, however dark, you will be all right. Irene swallowed the small sound that tried to come out of her, and instead looked toward the city, its pale stones resplendent in the last light of the setting sun. Through the open windows behind the healer on high, a night breeze laced with lavender and cloves flitted in, cooling her face and ruffling Hafiza's cloud of white hair. Irene slid a hand into the pocket of her pale blue dress her fingers wrapping around the familiar smoothness of the folded piece of parchment. She clutched it, as she had often done on the sailing over here, during those initial few weeks of uncertainty even after Hafiza had admitted her, during the long hours and hard days and moments that had nearly broken her while she trained. A note, written by a stranger who had saved her life and granted her freedom in a matter of hours. Irene had never learned her name, that young woman who had worn her scars like some ladies wore their finest jewelry. The young woman who was a trained killer, but had purchased a healer's education. So many things, so many good things had come from that night. Irene sometimes wondered if it had actually happened. Might have believed she dreamed it if not for the note in her pocket, and the second object Irene had never sold, even when the gold had thinned. The ornate gold and ruby brooch worth more than an entire blocks of Antica. Adderland's colors. Irene had never learned where the young woman had come from, who had bestowed the beating that had left lingering bruises on her pretty face. But she had spoken of Adderland as Irene did, as all the children who had lost everything to Adderland did, those children with their kingdoms left in ash and blood and ruin. Irene ran a thumb over the note, the words inked there, for, for, ev for wherever you need to go, and then some, the world needs more healers. Irene breathed in the first night breeze, the spices and brine it ushered into the Torre. She looked back to Hafiza at last, the healer on high's face calm, patient. Irene would regret it if she refused. Hafiza would yield, but Irene knew that whether she left here, whether she somehow decided to remain, she would regret. Think back on this. Wonder if she had repaid the extraordinary kindness she'd been given rather poorly. Wondered what her mother would have thought of it. And even if this man hailed from Adderland, even if he'd done the bidding of that butcher, I will meet with him. Assess his. Assess him. Irene conceded. Her voice only wobbled slightly. She clutched that piece of paper in her pocket. And then decide if I will heal him. Hafiza considered. Fair enough, girl, she said quietly. Fair enough. Irene blew out a shaking breath. When do I see him? Tomorrow, Hafiza said, and Irene winced. The Kagan has asked you to come to Lord Westfall's chambers tomorrow. And that was chapter four of Tower of Dawn. And where we are going to call it for tonight. As it is almost nine o'clock, and I can guarantee you the next chapter is not gonna be short enough for me to get through. And honestly, my nose is my nose is really driving me crazy. I'm not gonna lie.
So we are gonna go ahead and wrap up this stream. As always, here is the reading guide for everyone's reference again. So next stream, we will uh, start off with Tower of Dawn Chapter 5. Um, I think that's what we're at, right? I think. I think. Yeah, Chapter 5. That's what I said. <sighs> but again, thank you everyone.